On va commencer, recommencer. On va passer maintenant plus vers l'étude de, de concrets et pratiques de comment on fait de la prospective uh, doing it uh, in the field. Uh, I present uh, Helen von Rubnitz. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, you can take a seat and uh, maybe you come a bit, little bit closer to be more, to get more in touch with the la prospective as we say in France, or foresight. So I have been asked to speak in English. For me, it's no difference. Both languages are foreign languages because I'm a German citizen. So, but I uh, live in France since about uh, almost 20 years. And about 23 years ago, I did my first uh, foresight exercise for me myself because I was working very hard as an independent consultant. And uh, one day there was a reflection, why don't you apply This is what you teach to others and what you do with companies, public and private companies, to yourself. And I developed um, a foresight exercise for myself, and the result was that I have to increase to improve my quality of life, and this was the basis of a decision to settle down in southern France. So I stopped my activity in Germany. I moved to southern France, to uh, Vans, which is near Nice, And I think this was one of the best decisions I have made in my life, thanks to foresight exercise. So I just want to show you, we come down from a very philosophical and a very sophisticated approach. I want to show you how you can translate this very sophisticated approach into something very concrete. I'll give you an example of an educational uh, institution and also an example of a person. So... Uh, I think it's important uh, to be aware, you have heard a lot from Fabienne, what is the philosophy of la prospective and foresight. I do not want to repeat that. And I, I like this word very much, we must be the change we want to see in the world. This implies that you yourself have to start to change and not waiting that the others, the state, the company, the public authorities, the territories, etc., do make this kind of change. So it's your responsibility. If you want to be somewhere else in the future, so you have to do it and not to wait for anything else. Uh, just a, a short uh, methodological reflection. You can imagine the future like a funnel opening. All possible, all futures you can imagine are anywhere here in the funnel opening. And there are lots of futures. So you cannot develop all these futures. This is impossible. What you have to do, you have to select a few futures. This, to go back to Fabienne's uh, terminology, these are explorative futures, explorative scenarios. For example, very often you work with four or sometimes with two. So this is a normal uh, number. Looking into the future is one thing. This is the exploration. But what is also very important is the other thing, is the normative future. What is the future you want to create for your organization, for your country, or for you yourself? So first you explore what might happen, what is possible, explore all the possibilities, and then you come back and say, okay, what have I learned from these virtual future trips or virtual future travels? And then to get inspired or to use these future situations, these scenarios, in order to trigger your creativity. If these changes might happen in the future, where is my place? How can that give me a new idea of my own future, or for my company, for my organization, etc.? So Fabienne also mentioned opportunities and threats and risks. You find them also here. So we have to identify the future opportunities and risks, and then we develop answers how we can deal with them. How can we cope with risks or threats? How can we turn them? That is the, the higher stage of uh, foresight. How can we turn these, these risks and threats into opportunities for us? And the other question is, how can we seize the opportunities the er the, at the earliest stage? Not when all the others have recognized, yes, a major trend is going into this direction. You have to do it before. Let's come to something more concrete. I will give you an example. Uh, I have recently uh, finished a uh, um, foresight exercise for uh, a higher technical, 
a technical high school, you would say. It's a very strange mixed form. So uh, kids from 14 to about 18, 19 stay there. They have the normal, uh, the normal high school approach, but with a very technical, uh, in a very technical way. And this school, it's called TGM. It has a lot of laboratories, and it's working intensively together with industry. So uh, one day, one of the new directors, who had already done some foresight exercises with me, asked some crucial questions to the other directors. How do you will position yourself in the future? What are you doing with all the competition coming around? Where will be your clients or your students in the future? Were these just people from the Vienna region or Austria or Europe or maybe outside of Europe? How can you finance all your infrastructure and what you offer? They have about 1,000 students, 300 teachers. So uh, these questions uh, were discussed, um, yes, in a very passionate way. And the result was that they said, okay, we try this kind of foresight exercise. Because they had, a, as I sensed, already a lot of problems, demographic problems, less students, and also a lot of competition by other technical schools uh, founded around them. And there's also a strong international competition. For example, a lot of rich people, they sent their kids to other more highly reputated schools abroad. Finance problems, how to finance, because the infrastructure is very costly. The political changes in the education system, and uh, the harmonization, you all know the Bologna process, where we go to more and more harmonization. It's not only Europe. There are already 45, if I'm right, 45 countries involved in that. And what is also interesting, industry was asking for new technical and managerial skills. So we need engineers, technics, technicians, scienti scientists with a specific also managerial skills and not only technical skills. So these were some of the starting points, reflection points of this uh, institute. Now the project design. Um, we had a steering committee, and the steering committee, they uh, decided after each step, do we go forward or not? So we have to present the results, and then they said, yes, you can go ahead. That was a very good, a good thing, to, because not only at the end, but also in between, you have to deliver a certain kind of quality. Uh, we had a workshop team, about 16 people, and an external facilitator, which <laughs> was me. And we also invited experts from all uh, areas which had an impact on this kind of school system. Something interesting was the participants casting. It's a little bit uh, uh, flashy to say that. But we asked people to participate, and we said, you have to apply for this job as a team member. You have to file an application and to say why you are the right person to participate in this kind of exercise. So we had a few criteria. They had still to live in 2025, had to fulfill their function in the school or outside in a management position. Uh, we, we, had, we said we want a kind of a mixed team, so we wanted not only teachers, we wanted, also wanted students, and we wanted people from industry who are former students of this technical school. So, and another thing was also very interesting, because it's a big school, 1,000 students, about 300 uh, teachers, in order to communicate this future exercise, we asked people to create uh, a name and a logo for this project. And this was a very good thing, because everybody was talking about this. So you spread, you disseminate the information, Yes, something is going on. This is something new. We haven't done that so far. We always look backwards. Now we look forward. And, and they also, so we had, what you see here, this is the, this is the logo. And I, I like it very much, Thinking Future. And ENG is the abbreviation for engineer. In, in, the Austrians like to, to put the title, engineer. So, uh, and they said, Thinking Future and TGM, that's the name of the school, goes 2025. So uh, I think the point was said, it was in English. It's not that I have translated it. It's, a German, it's an Austrian school, but we put this in English. So with this contest for the logo and the name, everybody was informed. That was a quite good thing. Now the project phases. We had to do with people who never have done a foresight exercise before. So what they needed was first 
a two-day seminar, what is foresight, what can we do, what are the steps, what is the outcome, etc., etc. They had a team training, and they had a very intensive uh, learning phase. We call that the learning phase, where we had um, interventions, lectures from experts from all over domains having an impact on the school. Uh, there was a sociologist, a politician, IT people, other engineers, uh, and I had also, I had been asked to give a lecture about governance. So this was the first phase. So just to, to stimulate people's brain to think a little bit more in future dimensions, to open up something here in their brain. The next thing was a foresight project. So we had about five workshops and with participants, as I said, from the teachers, alumni, and the student group. And furthermore, in order to extend, to stimulate the future thinking, uh, in one phase, we have invited, the phase where we talked about the projections, the exploring the future, we have invited other experts, and we were not only working with 16, but with 44 people. So you see there was a lot of effort done in order to, to push, to boost this kind of future thinking. Now, uh, I just give you a very, very short picture about the Senai, so we are airborne. Um, I liked very much uh, Fabienne's uh, trip to Mars. So for me, uh, the, the metaphor for future trips is flying. So you're here on, on, on the ground, and then you, you are airborne. So you leave the ground, so you are in a, in a new environment. But we know, all know flying is a secure thing if we follow some aerodynamics and other physics law. So, and future trips are similar. But you leave something which is very familiar to you, which is a certain, it's a ground of today of facts and figures. The facts and figures, somebody you produce for the future, are not real facts or figures because they are just the quantification of assumptions. You shouldn't forget that because very often we read some forecasts and other things, uh, the BNP of France in the year 2035, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. These Figures are not real figures. Now let's, let's go ahead with our future trip. I just show you a small picture where you can see a little bit one of the scenarios. Uh, I start with politics. The first scenario is um, based on the hypothesis that uh, we have common EU standards in uh, education, uh, governance standards, and a lot of things are harmonized all over Europe. The other thing is that in society, people are aware that education is key to anything. It's paramount. Without education, you cannot do anything in your life. And we also talk, I think that is a, a running uh, a word which everybody uses, LLL, lifelong learning. So it doesn't stop when you leave university. You always have to learn until the rest of your life. And that makes life also so interesting. So. And we have here a Europe of multiculturalism. So we have a mix of people from, for example, Austria, go study abroad, and others from other countries come there to, to go to these technical schools. Uh, technology, we have, the, we have dealt with a lot of different technologies, from IT, biosciences, material sciences, anything. Uh, everything has developed here, and that's in a, in a more sustainable high-tech. High-tech, yes, but in a sustainable way. Sustainable and with meaning. And we said Austria might become, because they're way on the green and ecology trip, might become the green tech valley of Europe. And uh, there, is all, there was also one idea to create a sustainable econo economy welfare index. So companies are not only evaluated according to their facts and figures and the balance sheet, but also to this kind of new index. Let's have a look at the students. We have a lot of international students, and uh, performance ratings are very important. It's very interesting here, in this scenario, worldwide, all the technical schools, all the universities are, are rated constantly according to their performance, openness, uh, a, lot of, a lot of criteria. So it's a very, very tough competitive situation. That's very important. We have new individual IT-based and on um, new learning methods, also learning methods based on brain research, and I think there come, a lot of new things will come up. Uh, we also define the role of the teacher in a different way. The teacher will become a learning coach. 
So that redefines the teacher's role in a completely different way. So he has to help and to create the environment that the students can progress as best uh, as possible. Um, also interesting, at the moment, they have very, very few girls in the schools, and they said, okay, if technology becomes sustainable and more meaningful, this makes technology also more attractive for girls. And one of the uh, assumptions was to have 50% of girls in the technical schools. At the moment, they're about uh, 5 or 2, 10%. So as I said, the competition also between the schools on an international level is extremely tough. So uh, you have to be an extremely high performer in order to be on the top list, in order to be financed and survive. Those who do not fulfill this criteria, they will disappear. So it's, it seems it looks a little bit nice, but it's a very, very tough performance and competition scenario. So we have some pictures here. Um, the internationalism, Europe is unified, and also the lady in the cockpit of a, <laughs> of a military fighter. But you see the irony, they had some, some holder for the for the handbag. So that is a very, <laughs> that is just uh, the jokes they have made. So now let's switch to the other scenario. I just put the extremes. There are others in between, but I do not want to tell everybody. So we have, there's no guarantee that we have harmonized everything in Europe, that we come to a sign of unification in education, etc. So there might be diverse national systems who say, no, no, we do not follow this a general trend. We have something specific and we try to guide that. Also more on a regional level, we have progress in technology but less on the sustainable issue. And we said here under this scenario we can also imagine that Europe is a bit losing, though they talked more or less about Austria, but Europe is losing, and that the power shift, again the power, the paradigm shift, the power shift uh, is that Asia is a new boom region. A lot of people talk about that, that this century will be the century of Asia. And uh, so we, have, we lose a little bit track here, but they had an, uh, an interesting solution that, okay, if this will happen, Austria will be the Alpine Disneyland for all the Asians and others who come to Europe and might uh, spend their vacation there. We have less students because there's another problem in society. Technology is not very cool. So people go less and less to technological studies so that we lose on this hand. And on the other hand, we have not the international uh, students coming to, to Austria. Uh, the school system, so it's a little bit technology. It's a little bit the hard, tough, the hard stuff, the hard uh, technology. It's not the meaningful, the soft, the sustainable technology. So it's not... Uh, this, the girl said it's too much testosterone loading, uh, this kind of technology. We don't want that. And we have a specialization and a kind of political protection because on an international level this will not work. The methods are completely different here. As people are not so much on life, long, lifelong learning focused, from time to time they have to perform. And we said this is a society of a more, a little bit superficial so you have to appear, you have to do a good show. Casting is a, is a catchword here. So it's not the profound studies, but sometimes you have to perform, and then you go to a boot camp in order that, you, they, that they make you fit to, uh, to survive in the, boot camp, in, the, in the casting. Another picture here, you see the boot camps and people barking at each other, so and the robotics, but also other, other things like... Uh, yeah, it's not always technology. It's also, as we said, Alpine Disneyland, so we have to go more to the tourism area. So the question is, these are very extreme scenarios. They are like yin and yang. So now you have to, di have to define your wishful future, your vision where you want to go, and this vision has to be compatible with the different futures, which is a very high, um, high requirement. My metaphor is this kind of trimaran or outrigger boat. You see it again. You have in the middle the hull of the boat. You have all the strategies which are compatible under different scenarios. And in each of the outrigger, you have only the strategies which are compatible, for example, with scenario B or with the scenario A. So this is called a master guideline. This is your vision, where you want to be in the future and how to get there. Not only a vision. A vision is nice. 
But if you have no idea, no concrete things behind how to get there, it's pie in the sky. So now a few things. I cannot tell everything because uh, they are still in the – this just started the implementation. Just a few things about uh, this institute. Um, the vision is TGM, the Institute of Engineering. And they said it in English. It's not a translation from German. The Institute of Engineering. At the moment, they call him, themselves TGM, Die Schule der Technik, the School of Technology. Now, the Institute of Engineering. Um, they want to be the benchmark, the leading, the pioneer of the Austrian technical high schools with sustainability, innovation. These were the, the, the ethic uh, aspects innovation, responsibility, but also independence and the family spirit. The family spirit looks, sounds a bit strange, but family spirit means they have created a big family. All the alumni are in a kind of association, about 6,000 people. They are now in leading position in Austria's industry and abroad, and they all commonly have financed this project. It was not the school, it was the alumni association which has financed the whole issue. So this, you see there is a strong bond to this technical school. Then they said what we, what we lack completely is a kind of international uh, approach. We need a strong national and international brand to create really something as a brand. Because in Austria, when somebody um, applies for a job, a technical job in Austrian industry, and looks at your CV, you, you have been at TGM, this opens you doors. Because the industry knows these people, they have not only a good technical background, but also a very good practical background. So um, this was one thing. So we had to introduce a professional international marketing, which they don't have. It's just uh, uh, word of mouth. Just the people, okay, the father, the uncle, and who whatsoever has been at that school, the kids, and uh, go to the school as well. So they had to establish a really a professional marketing. They had not yet a marketing department until now, but now they are building up one. Uh, they talked about the TGM certificate because it's so unique. They have uh, large laboratories, which cost a lot of money, but this is a school with the best equipment in, in laboratories. So they do a lot of research for the industry. There are a lot of common projects for the students. They do research for the industry. What we also said, we need new educational forms and offers. For example, e-learning or blended e-learning. They want to create a campus, a second chance program for those who could not make it, but later on they said, okay, now I want to make uh, my certificate, my diploma, and to reinforce a partnership with all the alumni and also international institutions and corporations, because they have, they are quite clear, if we don't have this connection to the industry, to other partners, we cannot survive financially. That's very important. But also with regard to the content and the research and so on. Uh, another thing is uh, extend the target group. Yeah, that's also very interesting. We have learned there's a demographic decline. We have less youngsters. So we can compensate a little bit by getting people from abroad, but under the scenario B, there is nothing coming from abroad. So we have to be clear that the normal student numbers will decrease in the future. That means we have to look for other customers, for other target groups. And they said, okay, why do not starting very younger? For example, not only at 14 years, but we can also discover technical talents at the age of 8 or 10 or 12 years. So we have to develop another, other technical um, curricula and technical classes for younger people. So that was one, going to the younger age group, and the other one was going to the elder age group. For example, going until the bachelor. So they, what they want to do is to, to have this kind of certificate bachelor, which they offer now at the school, and also to create a private school in partnership, of course, with other well-reputed institutions in the world, and to, to, to run some uh, courses, technical courses for, courses for corporations. So extend their low, their younger, and their elder uh, customer groups. Uh, another thing, the most difficult point was to transform all the teachers. 
who are there since quite a while and who do their job with their specific mindset and who are, who are not very open to, to change. But after this exercise, there was a big change also within the teacher group. We said the teachers should not be a teacher, only a teacher. He should be a professional entrepreneur and a coach because we need the young engineer who will later found this company he has to have uh, entrepreneurial skills. And uh, what industry is also asking for, the social, practical, and management skills. So that was a big, a big discussion, how to transform, how to change our teacher group. Uh, I'd like to show you the key success factors of this uh, foresight exercise. Um, and this is something which I apply very often because I have learned that this model, this way of doing the kind of foresight exercises, helps best to, uh, to succeed the implementation because the critical step, you know, is when you go from the exercise and then you go really to the hands-on how to implement this, how to change this and this in the organization, how to change the strategy, etc. I think one of the key fact, uh, success factors is go public. So this was not um, a secret strategy circle where everybody said, oh, you never know what they are talking about. This was something really broadly communicated within the whole community, not only the school but also the alumni network. They also send people as participants to the, to the workshops. And uh, we have also regular news interviews on their platform. They have a newsletter called Der Technologe. Well, you can imagine what it means. And uh, I have written uh, regularly articles, but also the other team members. And everybody has put his own view how he has lived this exercise. So it became something all the others who did not participate in the exercise could easily imagine what we have done and how we have, uh, how we have achieved this or that. And the other thing was to involve even more people who could be a backbone in the implementation. So that was the, um, the uh, enlargement of our workshop where we were talking about the projections and we worked with about 44 people, as I told you before. Uh, another thing was we had always this kind of playful spirit. We said, okay, the others who could not participate, everything has been communicated, all the results, and we asked people, could you visualize the scenarios? Could you write a fascinating story about that so that you can communicate this within your family, within your, uh, within your working group, within your class? And one of the teachers, I love that, she has created a program for the students how to develop their own future. So she transferred what I have also done, this as a, as a content for the students, and they were very creative. That was an interesting exercise. You can say what you need is you create emotion, passion. It should be playful. It should be something which marks your, your life within an organization. So I remember sometimes I meet people from very long ago, and I said, I never forget what we have done, and there are still things I do today what we have learned in this foresight exercise. This is good for you. This is, then you have really, set a milestone in people's mind. So foresight is not just something very uh, artificial, uh, just philosophical. It's really hands-on. So that's why we have done this example. So yes, we can. That was, uh, at the beginning, they were very, very skeptical, mainly the teachers group. At the end, it has completely changed. And now I address myself to you. We all, you all have a future. Do you know exactly what you want to do? And there are a few key questions. Are you really happy now, what you are doing professionally or in your private life? And if there is any doubt, what are you doing? A lot of people, I coach also people in that, and they come that, yeah, I'm not happy, but I, I don't dare to get the company because to, to, to do something else, it's too risky, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So people, they want to change, but they have not the courage to change. So foresight is also something which helps you to develop this courage for change. The problem is where you have courage, fear of change, because sometimes what you have, what you live up, you are not very happy, you are complaining all the time, but it's not so tough that you change something. So you are in a quite comfortable zone, so it can go on. But sometimes you need an event and I have very often people, uh, 
well, the, the company has uh, relocated uh, the site to another country, and now they are without a job. Yes, since some years I have that dream to start to become a self-employed engineer, uh, consultant, or whatsoever. Now it's the moment. It would be better to have that prepared before you get licensed, okay, or get laid off. What we have to do, we have to learn how to deal with uncertainties. That's a big problem because the people, they want certainty about the future. There is no certainty about the future. There's a nice Arab word which says, those who pretend to know the future lie, even if they accidentally speak truth. Nobody knows what will come. Yeah? We have ideas, we have assumptions, and we, have, we can make some, some pictures about the future, but nobody can guarantee you this or that will happen. So we have to learn how to deal with all these uncertainties. We have to think in alternatives, and not only one plot into the future, one path. We have to also to prepare alternatives for ourselves in our personal future. Uh, we cannot do that now. Uh, normally when I do some uh, workshops, uh, I ask people to do that here, but you have all the information on the platform, you have the PowerPoint on the platform. I think that would be really worth to think about where do we want to be in about five to ten years from now, personally, professionally. Do you have an idea how to get there? And if not, it's it's high noon, you should start it. And I do that regularly. I don't do that only for others, I do it also for myself. So I have an idea, what I will do when I'm a charming elder lady. I have my ideas, and I'm really keen on implementing that. So, so as a, that was a nice word, the Queen Mum said one day to a 17-year-old noble lady, if you want to be a charming lady at the age of 70, you should start at 17 to prepare yourself. That's a very nice word. I didn't categorize her as a prospectivist, but it's something like this. Okay. Tja, Pat Dixon has said it. Either you get hold of the future or the future gets hold of you. So if you don't do anything, somebody else will do something. And then you might complain, but this is not the way I want to go. This is not the, the target I want to achieve. So be prepared. Do it for yourself. Nobody else can, can uh, do, can shape your future. And if somebody else shapes it, I have my doubts if it's the, sh uh, the future you want to have for you. When you talk about personal foresight, this is based on three pillars. It's one thing is what I know to do, my competences, my professional skills. It's one thing. The other thing is what I like to do. This is not always the same thing. Uh, you have competences, but this is not your passion. It's not where your heart is. So when I discovered foresight uh, more than 30 years ago, it made this tilt in my head and said, yes, this is it. I want to do this. So I was searching and floating around. I had a lot of ideas, but nothing really created this tilt. So what you know to do, what you like to do, what makes your heart vibrate when you do it? This is what you are looking for. And the third question is what the markets or the professional, the labor environment needs today and tomorrow. Today it's quite easy to answer. But tomorrow, here you start your foresight exercise. Yeah? You start to think ahead into the future, what is needed in the future. And then you come back, you do the, the same foresight process as for an organization, public or private. Just, of course, smaller, less variables, etc. But in the, in the methodology, it's the same approach. And I can tell you, it gives you a lot of interesting insights. And I like very much what Fabienne said. Even if you don't go to Mars, you know how to do. You are prepared. You have gained so much uh, information, competence, or skills which enriches what you do now, even if you don't go. But think about that. I think it's a, it's a really nice exercise. And I like to ask a lot of questions. What, is your, what are your values? What is your raison d'être? Uh, a lot of uh, questions. And a lot of people are really, not, uh, are really not aware what is their raison d'être. It's really shocking. So they live their lives uh, like... Uh, 
a little ant doing working uh, whatsoever, reproducing, etc. But uh, why are you here on this earth? What's your mission? There is something. And, and I insist also that my coaches, which might work on this exercise, that they have to answer these questions. If they have not the answer at the beginning of the process, that might happen. I insist that they have the answer at the end of the process, inspired by a lot of things. So you do, on one hand, I say, a kind of archaeological work, because you dig into yourself, in your soul, in your past, and what is important for you in your value system. And on the other, high, on the other hand, you explore two different futures. So, and the ideal situation is that you find your profession, what you want to do with your life, where all these three circles interfere. That is the ideal thing. You have found what you love, what you can do, and what is also compatible with what the markets need today and tomorrow. That would be the ideal situation. So shaping your future needs anticipation and navigation. So navigation, <laughs> I think we have always the same metaphors. But it needs also a lot of courage. Without courage, there comes a moment you have prepared, you have all the resources together, but there comes a moment where you have to jump out of the aircraft with your parachute. You have to jump, okay? Yeah, and there's a guide, because it's not so easy. Uh, I have written several books. This is the last one. Um, the others are really more technical books on foresight. But this is a book where I try to explain how foresight can be applied to a person. So they exist in English, French, uh, German, and Korean. So, but I have not put the Korean version here on the, on the slide. So I think the others are more interesting for you. So, and my only word to say, I wish you future fitness with a lot of fun. Like you see with this dog jumping over this barrier, I think that should be a good metaphor. And I wish you very bright, very interesting, very exciting futures. Thank you very much. Thank you, Helen. Um,